Hi, uh, Romesh Shivastu here, Editor in Chief, Sites and Plus. Welcome to the YouTube channel. Please do subscribe this for the HR news, HR updates, and conversations that open on CHROs. Today, we are going to discuss uh, the code of conduct. The employee's code of conduct uh, is a must have policy for all the companies, and that is irrespective of the size of the organization. What I understand, the employee's code of conduct is a set of uh, values principles and rules of the organization and it also outlines the employer's expectation from their employees at the workplace especially when we talk about the culture and behavioral part to discuss in detail on the employees code of conduct today we have uh, mr manish call manish is a uh, general manager and head human resources and operational excellence at LNT for the heavy engineering division. Welcome, Mr. Manish. Thank you uh, uh, for inviting me to this discussion, uh, Ramesh. It's my pleasure to be here. So, Manish, sir, uh, I'll start with the uh, first basic question: that uh, what is the employee uh, code of the conduct, and uh, how do you see its purpose? A yeah, code of conduct is basically uh, a. a document which is uh, created to regulate the behavior of the people in the organization. So normally when we talk about the workmen, so for workmen you have legislations which uh, take care of uh, um, the discipline and uh, the code of conduct for them. It talks about uh, uh, the areas which will be minor misconducts or which will be major misconducts and things like that. However, uh, this does not cover the staff and the management staff as such. Now, uh, though we say that, yes, uh, this, this particular category of people, the management staff are, more, are uh, more of the elite people, and perhaps you don't need to really look at uh, uh, something uh, regulatory, so which the government, of course, has not done. So, but still, uh, it helps actually for uh, an organization to prepare an outline which guides the people as to what is the expected behavior uh, in the organization and what is it that the organization uh, may not promote and may not like uh, its people to follow. So this is basically a set of guidelines which is created and therefore uh, how it, it will be handled, managed and uh, who, who are the people who will be uh, the adjudicators in case uh, anything does not work fine. So it defines all of it. So who are the champions of this code? Who uh, develops this and uh, who administers this and who maintains the code of conduct in organization? Okay. The code of conduct is mainly uh, defined by the human resources heads in in tandem with the legal heads of the organization. And uh, there are different uh, elements which do not normally constitute a part of uh, the workmen regulations in the organization, but uh, are necessary in terms of uh, this level because uh, there is a lot of confidential information that is uh, contained with the management team members, which could be uh, both proprietary in nature and the organization may not be keen that such information is passed on outside of the environments of the organization. So that is one part of it in terms of behavior. It talks about uh, uh, business to be carried out with the right conduct and that we do not e use unethical means in any way to promote the business. Sometimes yeah. also we uh, call it like a code of ethics. So how do you differentiate between the code of conduct and uh, uh, ethics, uh, code of ethics? Co code, of, uh, code of conduct will, will be normally the umbrella. Okay. And code of ethics would be a part of it. Okay, so that is how if you really want to look at it uh, at a micro level or a macro level, so this is how it will be done. The code of ethics will find 
itself as one of uh, the important areas of code of conduct. Then we also talk about uh, um, the protocol to be followed when you are in the office, the protocol to be followed when you're conducting business with people, meeting people. And then when you are handling um, uh, executives from either gender. And uh, of course, uh, that anything is not going wrong. And so therefore, a whistleblower policy also embedded within the code of conduct. Okay. And a anti-corruption and anti-bribery policy also embedded into the code of conduct and things like that. So these are various uh, important factors actually, and that the people are behaving appropriately with um, the colleagues, peers, and superiors, and uh, basically no. Um, People are not trying to overshadow their colleagues and things like that. So that is, this is all what forms part of it. Yeah. So if we come to the process of uh, uh, developing a code of conduct, so as you already told me, it is, uh, uh, you know, managed by the head human resources and the legal team. Legal team helps uh, to draft this uh, the code of conduct. Do we also take yeah. some you know, feedback or uh, some inputs from the uh, other uh, uh, workers, employees, and staff member? Generally, when we are constituting the code of conduct, so maybe at the first stage, the HR will draft out and come out with a draft which is uh, prepared on the code. This is mostly discussed and shared at the senior management level to understand that if all the values of the organization and the behaviors, expected behaviors are encompassed in the document. And that is where the views are taken so, so that we are not missing something and that the general essence or the culture that we want to drive in the organization. So whether that um, it is still supporting the culture or it is not supporting the culture the way we want it. So all this, uh, discussions are deliberated and uh, then based on that uh, we agree to the common document which is what we finally publish so which uh, of the complaints uh, are being considered under this uh, uh, code of conduct and uh, what is the code of conduct violation if we talk about yeah, like I was mentioning to you about uh, the the behavior that a person exhibits during the time when he is working in the organization. So whether that is uh, uh, conducted in the right manner, and um, that any misconduct is not performed, and if uh, a misconduct is performed, then how do you manage it? So this is all uh, then defined defined actually into the code of conduct. And based on that, uh, the principles of natural justice uh, are, is adhered. And based on that, the person is given an opportunity to uh, explain the particular behavior which is not aligned to the organization's behavior and uh, a decision taken whether uh, this is something that uh, it's that is a major misconduct or a minor misconduct and accordingly the punishments are meted out but it is not exactly in line with the punishments, I would say. It is more to see that if there is a possibility to develop the person and improve him, then uh, the first priority is that. If the improvement is not possible and the behavior is of a grievous nature or the misconduct is of a grievous nature, then in that case, uh, 
uh, decisions are taken accordingly. So it could also <coughs> include the ultimate decision of separating the person from the organization. So if any employee, uh, you know, experience the behavior uh, problem with any another uh, PR or any, anyone else, uh, any another uh, uh, complaint which uh, comes uh, under the code of conduct. So what is the process to register the complaint? How uh, he or she can register the complaint? And uh, what is the process of inquiry for this? Okay. There are there will be two different ways in which uh, things are handled. One is uh, um, when we look at matters related to prevention of sexual harassment. So there uh, it is guided by an enactment and based on that the process is conducted. And that also is under the purview of code of conduct of the organization. So the process defined there in that particular legislation is followed, yes. But in case of other uh, um, misconducts, the scenario is that mostly a charge sheet is given to the employee, asking him to explain the behavior. And uh, again, appropriate time is given for him to respond. So necessarily like 48 hours and 72 hours, which is provided in the standing orders and things like that. So that may or may not be adhered. And uh, after the person has responded, then in that case, uh, depending upon the satisfaction on the reply that has been received. So if an inquiry needs to be conducted, then the process of inquiry could have a team of uh, uh, senior people in the organization to do it, which again is not defined, but mostly would be one person from HR, one from legal and uh, any other executive. So mostly we try to keep three people in an inquiry. But uh, organizations are not bound with that. They can use their discretion. It could be a single person inquiry also. And uh, then based on the different responses that are gathered over from the person. And uh, if there is a lot of circumstantial evidence also, so there's not necessarily evidence, but circumstantial evidence also available. So that is considered as good enough for taking a, um, for going ahead with a report from the inquiry officer and um, taking a decision. Um, similar to the inquiries that we do in the case of workmen. So here also we can have a external um, uh, expert or a lawyer to conduct the inquiry so that if you want to ensure neutrality in the entire process. And in the cases of, I have personally handled in the cases of fraud and uh, um, for age of money, etc. So there uh, we have used external lawyers to conduct such processes and uh, so that uh, the employee is clear that adequate fairness is being adopted in the process. And similar to in a domestic inquiry, so you have um, the employee presenting the document, documentary evidence that the person may want to provide and a management representative presenting on the charges that are being leveled and why and what do they have in support of that. So mostly this is internal and uh, external people are not allowed to, to represent the employee or represent the management as such. It is mostly internal people only that is there. And to maintain confidentiality of the entire process, mostly a isolated spot is picked up so that uh, it is not visible mostly to the employee. So it could be outside of... Uh, 
the premises at a common place or it could be in the premises but in an isolated uh, conference room where a uh, lot of discretion is maintained so sir is there any uh, timeline for the uh, grievance uh, redressal after getting the complaint there is no time uh, limitation okay but mostly uh, once we are sure that uh, the inquiry has progressed to give you an evidence and even the inquiry officer himself is convinced that he already has sufficient information to progress then uh, he may take it forward sometimes it may get winded up within a week sometimes mm -hmm. it may take up to 3 months in uh, the posh matters it is uh, normally mentioned as 90 days so right. say. so that is that is how it is followed the code of conduct may define that timeline but mostly i have not seen any code of conduct uh, document defining the timeline for investigation so any uh, any uh, uh, punishment uh, what the punishment may be uh, you know uh, given if the complaint is proved maximum depends what? again uh, it, it depends upon the nature of the um, or the gravity of the charges which are leveled so this uh, could include demotion of the person or transfer of location or transfer of department or ultimate punishment of discharging him from the services in case uh, employee is not satisfied with the uh, the uh, punishment or uh, what the uh, final outcome is of the inquiry can he or she move to the court possible he can definitely move to the court okay any case study you would like to share uh, if you have recently done any uh, inquiry for the under this code of conduct at in any, most of any the other cases, organization i have i have handled i have handled uh, quite a few so in most of the cases what we do is on conclusion if the person is found guilty then uh, the person is apprised about the decision before a actual document is served to him him or her and considering that the decision is not going to be in favor of the guilty person so it is normally advised that he puts in um, a voluntary resignation instead of that we issue a termination from the organization so that the person has a, a respectful separation right otherwise if there is a termination that flows to the person then lot of benefits are seized so which will not be passed on to the employee and the employee also stands a chance that in the matters of employee verification from the next employer so if a negative um negative report goes from the current employer to the new employer the person may suffer and may not uh, be eligible for alternative employment and this is something which is very much practiced within almost all the private employers private and public sector organizations where a background check definitely happens and uh, people seek information from the last organization related to the reason of leaving of the employee i think uh, uh, we have touched all the important parts of the uh, code of conduct so still if you think anything is important and uh, that should be shared so as a concluding remark want to share anything else yeah actually code of conduct uh, is a good document to see what all things do form a part of the work uh, behavior in the organization and are not in the ambit of uh, any of uh, 
the cases. Say, for example, we talk also about uh, gifting in the organization. So uh, organizations define that employees can accept gifts up to a certain cost. When it comes to entertainment, then there is a definition of what is what is legal, what is ethical that a company can promote as legal. There are a lot of legislations globally which have effect outside of their boundaries, especially the US laws, they have access to people across the globe. So anybody can be uh, challenged in the court of law in the USA. If uh, any inappropriate work practices have been used while trading, so things like that. So therefore, uh, the, the code of conduct will define what is uh, right and what should not be done so that employees are cautious that they are not falling on the wrong side of the global laws. Similarly, European laws are there. Similarly, laws from UK are there, which can which have jurisdiction beyond their uh, country limits and uh, they can challenge anybody anywhere. So thank you so much, Manish, sir, for joining the conversation and sharing your wonderful thoughts on the code of conduct. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you so much.